Thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight to the San Diego Museum of Art and to our James S. Copley Auditorium uh, for our first Friday film program. It's January 4th. It's so great to see so many people here uh, for great culture. My name is Alexander Jarman. I have the very fun job of manager of public programs here at the museum. Um, and I want to remind you that it's called First Friday Films because we do it every First Friday. So um, pl plan on the First Friday being a good night to see some films. Um, and uh, everything is up to date on our website in terms of the calendar. Tonight we are celebrating Behold America, which is our exhibition um, up right now of American art. It's a collaboration between ourselves, the Timken Museum of Art, which is right across from us, and the Museum of Contemporary Art, which is in, uh, uh, the show is in their La Jolla location. Um, and this is an incredible collaborative show. You're going to go up to La Jolla, which is a contemporary museum, and see 19th century landscapes uh, from uh, Americans. And you're going to come to our museum and the Timken Museum, which are encyclopedic museums, and see contemporary art. Um, so it's, it's really great, and it's, um, this exhibition has made us, really challenged us here at the museum to think about American art in new and different ways. And uh, very quickly, I don't know if she's here or not, but that is all due to our incredible, indefatigable curator, Amy Galpin, who put together the show, and I just want to have a round of applause for her very quickly. Um, the film tonight, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, was actually at the almost at the very top of both Amy and I's list um, for the film program in conjunction with this exhibition. So uh, we kind of had one of those incredible art history dorky moments where we're jumping up and down in her office like, this is great, yes, let's do this, let's make this happen, let's fast track this, all that stuff. Um, and usually we, uh, many, of, many of you, I see a lot of familiar faces, many of you have been to these programs and you know we start off the film um, with a lecture and um, we've had lectures from everyone from historians, art historians, uh, film historians, um, to artists themselves and um, tonight I'm very happy that we are able to welcome an uh, incredible living artist, Jericho uh, Brown, to open things up for us. So a little bit about Jericho, very quickly. Um, Jericho was the speechwriter for the mayor of New Orleans before he went over to the University of Houston and got his PhD in creative writing and literature. His work has won him fellowships from such prestigious organizations as the National Endowment for Arts and the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard University, and his work has appeared in such publications as the American Poetry Review, the Oxford American, Plowshares, and 100 Best African American Poems. Now his book, Please, which is right back there at the table with my colleague, uh, Miss Danielle, um, and is for sale and will be signed by Jericho after he reads. Um, and there's a, there's a limited uh, number of them back there, so I encourage you to, to go back there as soon as he he's done and pick up a copy of that. Um, his book, Please, won the American Book Award. Not bad for your first book. Now, I'm very, very sad um, for us, very happy for him, uh, to say that Jericho is now a professor at Emory University, which happens to be on the other side of the country. Um, but of course, some of you that are here tonight uh, know that he was with us here in San Diego as a professor at USD, and that's actually how I first uh, met Jericho. We had him um, read at the museum in the summer of 2011 as part of our Summer Salon series. And this exhibition, Behold America, um, has a title uh, that some of you recognize as coming from Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, um, published over 100, uh, first published over 150 years ago. Um, it, it met with a lot of controversy, uh, specifically because it was deemed as uh, this discussion of sensual pleasures, um, which was a, a somewhat immoral at the time. And um, I can't help but remember when Jericho was here reading and listening to his poems and having such an incredible visceral experience um, and really feeling things um, almost physically when I was listening to him speak. And um, 
Um, so I think it's it's very fitting that we bring a poet back here, um, being that that part of the show uh, draws its inspiration from a great poet, that we bring another great American poet back here to open things up. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me welcome Jericho Brown. Come here, come here, Alexander. Come here. Now, they wanted to, but they didn't get a chance to clap okay. for your glasses. <laughs> So this is all about, let me show you. So this is like the beginning of it. There's, this is a two part thing that he's doing, right? It's, it's called the head to toe upstage. This is how people upstage me wherever I go. So watch this, watch this. Now come on, show them. Okay. All right, we're just, we're gonna you see that. this? I don't know. It's, uh... this is, <laughs> see, and that's, th thank you. Yeah, clap for I, that. <laughs> that's good. Thank y'all. Thank y'all so much. Thank you so much for that introduction, um, Alexander, and thank you for inviting me back here to this museum, uh, to my home away from home. Uh, I, I have to say a very, a very special thank you to my students who have come here tonight. I'll, I'll wave and everybody look at them. They should be thoroughly embarrassed at all times. Is there, are there others? Are there more? Okay, good. Hello, love y'all. Um, I think it's really nice of them to come here. My students have always been the absolute best teachers that I've ever had. Um, thank you so much, Amy Galpin, for putting together this exhibit and for considering my work as part of this exhibit. Uh, I've been thinking, um, and I, th I guess this is part of the reason why I'm here, why I'm here, I've been thinking about the movie we're going to see tonight um, for probably somewhere between the last 20 to 25 years. Um, I'm not really good at subtraction. I think it must have come out, it must have come out sometime like somewhere between 88 and 90. I think um, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing came out. It, it had to be 89 because I was in the grade. And, um, <laughs> and um, I, uh, and I was so moved by it, and I continue to be moved by it every time I see it, and I think of it as a, as a huge influence on my own writing and my own work. So um, when, I, when I was coming here, my agent sent me this thing that Alexander sent her, so I have like instructions of what I'm supposed to do. So I'm going to read them to you like I'm not supposed to. It says, um, please give a 30-minute poetry reading with commentary to introduce the film night of the Behold America exhibition. We'd like to hear work that offers different and important takes on the American experience with commentary. They, they keep saying with commentary because they know I don't like to, I don't actually like to do a lot of talking between poems. Uh, part of the reason why I don't like to do that is because I think uh, my understanding of poetry is very different from a lot of other people's understanding of poetry. To, un to know what my understanding of poetry is, you have to know who Anita Baker is. If you don't know who Anita Baker is, then you need to know, put her on, you know, make sure you're on a date, you'll get some. <laughs> Anita Baker is a singer who, um, in the 1980s and 90s, had these beautiful songs. She's largely influenced by uh, the jazz singer Sarah Vaughan and by uh, Detroit gospel singers like the Clark Sisters. Uh, given that, given her influences, uh, you'll understand that at no point in an, in an Anita Baker song, when I was listening to her growing up, at no point in her songs did I have any idea what she was saying. Like you just could not understand the lyrics. They were just, it was just all like she has this really moaning contralto. Uh, and any of you who are familiar with Anita Baker know this about, about her voice. Uh, and yet, listening to the songs, you always knew exactly what the songs were about. Because you, you were listening to songs and you allowed yourself to feel the songs before you try to understand the songs. Do y'all understand what I mean by that? Uh, and I think that's the experience that we have to have with all of art, whether it's film, whether it is visual art, whether it is poetry, whether it is song. Okay, uh, that was because I'm black. And then, uh, <laughs> do the right thing. No, uh, <laughs> so um, 
Uh, so I'm, I'm going to, I'll do my best to remember to give commentary, but every once in a while I might forget and just start reading a bunch of poems. But you just have to remember you have to feel your way through things uh, rather than you know, try to depend on some sort of explanation of things. And then also my, my instructions here say, the exhibition will explore American identity and the re-examination of our history. The object is to help help audiences get in the mindset of understanding some of the complexities of identity politics which play out over the course of the film. And so I'm going to um, read some of my poems that I think are most influenced by Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, a film, by the way, that I really think is about not the statement, do the right thing, but the question, what is the right thing? What is the right thing in terms of our morals, our values, and our ethics? What is the right thing in terms of our heritage, our identity, our history? Uh, where I'm from, we always begin with prayer. Prayer of the backhanded, not the palm, not the pear tree switch, not the broomstick, nor the closest extension cord, not his braided belt, but God bless the back of my daddy's hand, which holding nothing tightly against me and not wrapped in leather eliminated the air between itself and my cheek. Make full this dimpled cheek unworthy of its unfisted print and forgive my forgetting the love of a hand hungry for reflex a hand that took no thought of its target like hail from a blind sky, involuntary, fast, but brutal in its bruising. Father, I bear the bridge of what might have been a broken nose. I lift to you what was a busted lip. Bless the boy who believes his best beatings lack intention, the mark of the beast. Bring back to life the son who glories in the sin of immediacy, calling it love. God, save the man whose arm, like an angel's invisible wing, may fly backward in fury, whether or not his son stands near. Help me hold in place my blazing jaw as I think to say, excuse me. This next poem is, um titled after a word that I didn't hear for a little while and now I hear it all the time. It's a word that, um, that means you and everybody with you. Nim. They said to say goodnight and not goodbye. Unplugged the TV when it rained. They hid Money in mattresses, so to sleep on their decisions. Some of their children were not their children. Some of their parents had no birth dates. They could sweat a cold out of you. They'd wake without an alarm telling them to. Even the short ones reached certain shelves. Even the skinny cooked animals too quick to get caught. And I don't care how ugly one of them arrived. That one got married to somebody fine. They fed families with change 
and wiped their kitchens clean. Then another century came. People like me forgot their name. Ring a ding a ding 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 ding. Ring a ding a ding ding. This next poem is a poem um, in several voices. This is. I thought to read this poem because so much of this movie is about um, about a single community. Um, this is sort of what I heard around the neighborhood growing up. Autobiography. Keep the line steady. Keep your back straight. Keep coming back for more. Keep fucking with me, Cletus. Keep putting your hands on me like that, and you'll always have a place to lay your head. Keep my waistline down. Keep your figure up. Keep your man happy. Keep a woman crazy. Keep your daddy off your mama or next time I'm calling the police. Keep these nappy headed children off my green, green grass. Keep talking smart if you want to. Keep looking at my man and I'll cut you a new eyelid. Keep looking me in my face when you tell your next lie. Keep on walking, I ain't talking to you anymore. Keep holding that last note. Keep singing while I get the splinter out. Keep singing for Jesus, baby, and everything will be all right. Keep me in your prayers. Keep us in your thoughts. Keep your eyes on the black one. He ain't got no sense. Keep your money in your pocket, Nelson, these hoes giving it away. Keep this one occupied. I'll get his wallet. Keep on living, honey, and you'll get old too. So I'm going to shift, shift gears here. Just read a few uh, persona poems. For those of you who don't know, a persona poem is a poem that is most definitely not in the voice of the poet. Um, this first poem is in the voice of, of the, the poet I've always thought of as my first poet. And when I say that, I say it in the same way that I, I think of uh, my first love or the way someone might think of their, their first kiss. Um, when I was growing up in Louisiana, I was fortunate enough to have a mother who couldn't afford childcare. So she would take us when she needed to um, have someone watch over us so that she could do whatever she needed to do alone, she would take my sister and myself to the library. And the, libraries did, the librarians didn't know it, but they were our babysitters. And uh, at the time, they didn't, have, um, they didn't have computers in the library, so there was really nothing to do there except uh, read books. Uh, um, so this, this poem, is in the voice of this poet who is the, the leading figure of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and he wrote a poem called The Negro Speaks of Rivers when he was 18 years old. Uh, every time I think about Langston Hughes writing a poem that amazing, and I think about him writing The Negro Speaks of Rivers when he's only 18 years old, I really hate Langston Hughes. <laughs> Um, the poem also mentions the Empress of Blues, Bessie Smith, who was his favorite singer, and it references his uh, testimony before the U.S. House of Representative Committee on Un-American Activities during McCarthyism and the Red Scare of the 1950s. Langston, Blue. O blood of the river of songs, O oh, songs of the river of blood, let me lie down. Let my words lie sound in the mouths of men repeating their invocations, pure and perfect as a moan that mounts in the mouth of Bessie Smith, blues for the angels kicked out of heaven. 
Blues for the angels who miss them still. Blues for my people and whatever water they know. Oh, weary drinkers drinking from the bloody river. Why go to heaven with Harlem so close? Why sing of rivers with a daddy of my own to miss? I remember him and taste a stain like blood coursing the body of a man chased by a mob. I write his running, his sweat. Here he climbs a poplar for the sky, but it is only sky. The river, follow me, you'll see. We tried to fly and learned we couldn't swim. Dear singing river full of my blood, are we as loud under water? Is it blood that binds brothers? Or is it the Mississippi running through the fattest vein of America? When I say home, I mean I wanted to write some lines. I wanted to hear the blues, but here I am swimming in the river again. What runs through the fat veins of a drowned body? What America can a body call home? When I say Congo, I mean blood. When I say Nile, I mean blood. When I say Euphrates, I mean, if only you knew what blood we have in common. So much in Louisiana, they call a man like me red. And red was too dark for my daddy. And my daddy was too dark for America. He ran like a man from my mother and me. And my mother's sobs are the songs of Bessie Smith, who wears more feathers than death. Oh, the death my people refuse to die. When I was 18, I wrote down the river, though I couldn't win a race, climbed a tree that winter, then fell flat on my wet red face, line after line, I read all the time, but there was nothing I could do about race. By the time of the riots that followed the 1968 assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, the song Reflections had made it to number two on the pop chart. Uh, it was the first single and album under the new name for Motown's biggest act, uh, and that is Diana Ross and the Supremes. While the group remains one of the most internationally known, the girls, as Ed Sullivan referred to them for introductions on his television variety show, were accused of not being black enough in the late 60s and scrutinized by African Americans for their show tune like Vegas styled performances. Track four Reflections, as performed by Diana Ross. I wanted to reflect the sun. I wore what glitters, smiled, left my eyes open, and on the ceiling of my mouth balanced a note as long as God allowed. My head tilted backwards, my arms stretched out and up. I kept praying if the red sun rising makes a sound, let my voice be that sound. I could hear the sun sing in 1968. I learned the word assassin and watched cities burn. Got another number one 
and somebody set Detroit on fire. That was power. White folks looking at me directly and going blind so they wouldn't have to see what in the world was burning black. One more persona poem. Janis Joplin recorded the Gershwin Standard Summertime with Big Brother and the Holding Company for their 1968 chart-topping album, Cheap Thrills. She died of a heroin overdose in 1970. She was 27 years old. Track five. Summertime, as performed by Janis Joplin. God's got his eye on me, but I ain't a sparrow. I'm more like a lawnmower. No, a chainsaw. Anything that might mangle each manicured lawn in Port Arthur, a place I wouldn't return to if the mayor offered me Every ounce of oil my daddy cans at the refinery. My voice, I mean, ain't sweet. Nothing nice about it. It won't fly, even with Jesus watching. I don't believe in Jesus. The Baxter boys climbed a tree just to throw persimmons at me. The good and perfect gifts from above hit like lightning, leave bruises. So I lied, I believe, but I don't think God likes me. The girls in the locker room slapped dirty pads across my face. They called me bitch, but I never bit back. I ain't a dog, chainsaw, I say. My voice hacks at you. I bet I tear my throat. I try so hard to sound jagged. I get high and say one thing so many times, like Willie Baker, who worked across the street. I saw some kids whip him with a belt while he repeated, please, school out, summertime, and the living lashed. Mama said I should be thankful that the town's worse to coloreds than they are to me, that I'd grow out of my acne. God must love Willie Baker, all that leather and steel, a please that sounds like music. See, I wouldn't know a sparrow from a mockingbird. The band plays, I just belt out, please. This tune ain't half the blues. I should be thankful I get high and moan like a lawnmower so nobody notices. I'm such an ugly girl. I'm such an ugly girl. I try to sing like a man. Boys call boy. I turn my face to God. I pray. I wish I could pour oil on everything green in Port Arthur. Uh, this next poem is a part of a, a longer poem, and um, in my mind, in a lot of ways, it, it references maybe not the final scene, but what I think of as the penultimate scene of, of the film. Um, it's, a, it's a poem that's in about seven parts. This is the sixth part of that poem. The Interrogation, part six, multiple choice. Metal makes for a chemical reaction. Now that my wrists are cuffed, I am not a citizen. What touches me claims contamination. What a shame. When the police come, they come in steel boots, precious metal. They want me kicked, so kick me, they do. I cannot say they love me, but I don't. But don't they seek me out as a lover would each with both hands bringing me to my knees under God, indivisible. 
I did not have to be born here. Men in every nation pray, and some standing, and some flat on their backs. Pray luscious silver, pray Christmas, a chain, a chain, even if it's pretty, even around the neck. I cannot say they love me with a new fist in my new bald mouth. Pray platinum teeth, show me a man who tells his children the police are here to protect them and I'll show you the son of a man who taught his children just where to dig. Not me, couldn't be, not on my knees. No citizen begs to find anything other than forgiveness. So this, this next poem takes a little bit more um, explaining. So I hope y'all give me the time to do it. It's, a, um, it's from a form. So you know there are these poems that, that poets keep trying to get right, like the sonnet, right? You know, it's, it's 14 lines and it's supposed to rhyme. This is a, a, a form that's actually older than the sonnet. It's from um, sixth century. It's a Persian form. It's called a huzzle. And part of the form includes um, the, the end, a rhyme at the end of every couplet. It's written in couplets. There's a rhyme at the end of every couplet. You have to repeat a single word at the end of the couplet, and you have to say your name at the end of the form. So that's, that's pretty much the form. This, this poem mentions uh, Duane Betts, who was uh, at 16 years old, sentenced to seven years in prison. Um, it also mentions Nina, Nina and Darius, who are played by Nia Long and Lorenz Tate in the 1997 film Love Jones. That's another film I love. Uh, and Brownfield Copeland, who is a character in The Third Life of Grange Copeland. That's Alice Walker's first novel. Alice Walker also wrote The Color Purple. Um, I, I had to write a, um, I just got this poem. Somebody asked me to do something and they asked me to like write this, I have to write a one sentence reason that the poem sort of arose. And um, the, 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 the sentence that I wrote is, a word by which my family, friends, and I are racked is prison, which is the antithesis of a word like freedom, which may be a synonym or antonym for a word like America, depending on your identity, your heritage, and your history. Uh, I should also say that the couplets are not supposed to be in any way connected. So you'll see. Hustle. They lie like stones and dare not shift. Even asleep, everyone hears in prison. Dwayne Betts deserves more than this dry ink for his teenage years in prison. In the film we keep watching, Nina takes Darius to a stepper's ball. Lovers hustle, slide, dip, as if none of them has a brother in prison. I dine with humans who think any book full of black characters is about race. A book full of white characters examines insanity near but never in prison. His whole family made a barricade of their bodies at the door to room 403. He died without the man he wanted. What use is love at home or in prison? We saw police pull sharks out of the water just to watch them not breathe. A brother meets members of his family as he passes the mirrors in prison. Sundays, I washed and dried her clothes after he threw them into the yard. In the novel I love, Brownfield kills his wife, gets only seven years in prison. 
I don't want to point my own sinful finger, so let's use your clean one instead. Some bright citizen reading this never considered a son's short hair in prison. In our house lived three men with one name, and all three fought or ran. I left Nelson Dimery the third for Jericho Brown, a name I earned in prison. Home stretch, I swear. Lunch. In a fast food line, one man pulls a penny from another man's hand, grins too wide a grin, and pays the extra change. The boy standing behind the register takes my jealous stare for one of disapproval and shakes his head at me to say, I hate faggots too. Carefully shifting my weight onto one skinny leg, I open my appropriate mouth to order. From the King James Version of the Bible, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Romans 12 and 1. I will begin with the body in the year of our Lord, porous and wet, love wrecked and willing, in my 23rd year, a certain obsession overtook my body, or I should say, I let a man touch me until I bled, until my blood met his hunger, and so was changed, was given a new name, as is the practice among my people who are several and whole, holy, and acceptable. On the whole, hurt by me, they will not call me brother. Hear me coming, and they cross their legs. As men are wont to hate women, as women are taught to hate themselves, they hate a woman, they smell in me. Every muscle of her body clenched in fits beneath men, heavy as heaven itself. My body, dear, dying, sacrifice, desirous as I will be, black as I am. Heart condition. I don't want to hurt a man, but I like to hear one beg. Two people touch twice a month in ten hotels, and we call it long distance. He holds down one coast. I wander the other like any African-American. Africa with its condition, and America with its condition and black folk born in this nation content to carry half of each. I shoulder my share. My man flies to touch me. Sky on our side. Sky above his world I wish to write, which is where I go wrong. Words are a sense of sound. I get smart. My mother shakes. Her head, my grandmother, sighs. He ain't got no sense. 
My grandmother is dead. She lives with me. I hear my mother shake her head over the phone. Somebody cut the cord. We have a long distance relationship. I lost half of her to a stroke. God gives to each a body. God gives every body its pains. When pain mounts in my body, I try thinking of my white forefathers who hurt their black bastards quite legally. I hate to say it, but one pain can ease another. Doctors, rather, I take pills. My man wants me to see a doctor. What are you when you leave your man wanting? What am I now that I think so fondly of airplanes? What's my name? Whose is it while we make love? My lover leaves me with words I wish to write. Flies from one side of a nation to the outside of our world. I don't want the world. I only want African sense of American sound. Him touching this body aware of its pains. Greetings, earthlings. My name is slow and stumbling. I come from planet trouble. I am here to love you, uncomfortable. Thank you. Yeah, I don't. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually, I'm actually a bit of a prude. Um, nobody ever believes me when I tell them this, but this is actually true about like me as a person. It's, what I usually do is I try to allow. I mean, for me, poetry was always the place where you could say the thing that you couldn't say in the grocery store line. You know, you could, you could put the reality that everyone knew was there. Every, I mean, there's this reality that we're all quite and very aware of. And one of, that, one of those pieces of that reality has to do with sex and sexuality and sensuality. But there are things that, in spite of that, we're just, we don't talk about. And yet, if you're supposed to have an intimate experience while reading the poem, then the poem has to begin to speak to those realities. And so what I, what I usually try to do is I just try to allow the poem to do what I myself may not do in the world. Um, it was actually really hard for me when I was picking some of the poems, because I literally made a list of all of my poems. This is really, you know, because I was all nervous about coming back to San Diego, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, so which one of these poems have something to do with this film? And then, or like, when, when I think about this film and I think about like my own writing, what comes up for me? And then I made this list and then I sort of just ranked them. Like, oh, that's a good poem, that's a good poem. And then like, I kept having these poems I didn't want to read in the top 10. <laughs> Cause I was like, I don't want to say that in front of people. <laughs> but then, you know, I have to, I mean, because I am a poet, I have to, have to do the right thing. Like there's this sort of moral and ethical thing that I think goes along with, with being an artist and that is, to deliver what I've been given. And what I've been given are, are the poems that I have, no matter how sensual or sexual they may be. Sir. Uh, since you're from New Orleans, <laughs> have you said any of your poems to music? Uh, yeah, actually I have. I, I worked with a, um, a dance troupe on a, a collaboration we did um, years ago in Houston, Texas. and what. Before I started writing as what, what people now call a page poet, 
I was a poet who was really interested in spoken word and slam work, and so I did a lot of a lot of that kind of work then. Um, but over time, I, I turned my attentions in a different direction. So what I would really love to do, there's a, a, a CD by Nika Giovanni, who is an absolute idol of mine, and she's actually a, a, a mentor of mine. She's been so kind to me ever since my book came out. It's really funny. She sent me an e my book came out, and I get an email from Nikki Giovanni, and of course I didn't. I'm like, who sends me this email and signs it, Nikki Giovanni? Like I'm like, and then later I see her, like I meet her for the first time, and she's like, did you get my email? You didn't say anything back, and I'm like, you really sent that email? <laughs> but anyway, so anyway, but um, she has this album called The Way I Feel, and I've always dreamed of doing something similar to that. It's like Sissy Houston singing in the background, and their tracks like produced by Arif Martin and Ashford and Simpson. I would love to do something like that with the work. Any other questions? Oh, there seems to be a question right there, and then we'll come over here, and then we'll go back to Lauren. Sir. You mean when I read the poem aloud? Yes. Oh, okay. What I try to do is I try to forget that I'm in front of people, and I try to allow the rhythms that, I try to recreate the feeling I had when I was writing lines in the poem in my head. And so certain lines that, for whatever reason, when I wrote it, I felt like, oh, I'm doing something now. I wrote that, you know, and I try, <laughs> what I try to do is I try to relive that experience. And that way, if I can sort of, um, sort of eliminate myself from the fact of there being an audience, then I can pretty much be the same guy that was with pen and paper or in front of a computer screen before that was sort of walking around in his pajamas like chanting to himself at three o'clock in the morning, you know, which is ultimately how my poems get written, right? And so I try to create that sort of chant-like thing all over again because I know that somewhere in there is the music of what I think the poem comes from. So, because for me, the poem never starts with the story of the poem. The poem always starts with a line that I am attracted to because of the musicality of the line. And then from that point, I push forward to another line, and then I push to another line, and then I push to another line. And I allow, I hope to allow, a story to emerge from that. But I, I'm not necessarily interested when I sit down in writing about the time I A, B, C, or D, because I believe that the time that I A, B, C, or D is going to come out anyway. That it really wouldn't be any fun for me to write about the time I A, B, C, or D. That's sort of a known thing that I, I know is going to happen. Question up here. Yeah. Uh, thanks for being so authentic in who you Th are and how you present yourself. Thank you. Oh. Everybody's clapping for that. That's good. Can you cite maybe if you can the major influences in your growth as a person? Yeah. Um, so, music, music obviously is really important to me. Um, all of Motown. Stevie Wonder's probably one of my favorite artists. Uh, I really love Prince. Um, I, I also, but in terms of poetry, Gwendolyn Brooks, a poet, um, the poet. Um, Gwen Brooks has lately been the poet I've been reading a lot of over and over again for some reason. Living poets that I am really attracted to include um, Louise Glick, um, Natasha Trethway, Terrence Hayes. Uh, I'm a really big fan of the poet Lucille Clifton. I'm also a fan of, um, uh, I do a lot of ekphrastic work, looking at photos or paintings and trying to draw poems from that work. Uh, so uh, I was talking earlier to Alexander about a, a painter that I admire a great deal named uh, Daniel Minter, uh, who I think you should, you know, you should really check his stuff out. It's M-I-N-T-E-R. I think he's amazing. Um, so it's, it's some of anything. I think the black church also is a huge influence. Uh, it was, I'm from a what they call a really religious family. Uh, and so when I was growing up, you know, just seeing my pastor 
church is um, church is a lot like a poem in and of itself because it's it's the home of pattern and variation. You know, you can see the order of service. You pretty much know what's going to happen whenever you go to church, but you don't know how it's going to happen. You know, there's a point in church, particularly in the black church, where somebody's going to shout, but you don't know who it's going to be. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so that kind of thing was it was really a huge influence on me growing up. Thank you for your question. Okay. Yes, I was very Im uh, impressed by the performance of your poetry. What I think you refer to as the chant. Yeah. Which was very dominant, I think, in your delivery. And it took me back a little to hear it. But then I became very uh, involved, I think, in the work. By Part of it was by that chant that you seem to take when you read it. I think it's so important. Do your poetry allowed and not just to read it on a page? Definitely, definitely, so I agree. So that was very interesting to me, and I wonder, I mean, I've heard people read their poetry before. I've never heard it read quite like you did. Is there something about the development of that style that you could comment on? Oh, that's, in that's interesting. Um, I mean, I do think that that has a lot to do with what I hear in my head. So some, I don't know where that sound comes from. Maybe it comes from the black church. but. Whatever it is that I hear in my head, I'm sort of trying to reflect that when I open my mouth. But I think for me, the thing that has always been interesting to me, another poet that I love is the poet Emily Dickinson. And part of why I love Dickinson so much is that I could always hear the poems. I remember reading her poems when I was very young and feeling as if, in spite of the fact that nobody was saying anything, and so that's always my goal. Do the poems from the page call out to a sound in the mind of the reader somehow? And so, and I think she does that in such an amazing way. I think Wallace Stevens is really good at that too. Um, so that, or somebody like Hopkins is really good at that as well. So that you, you actually hear the poem in spite of the fact that they're not being read aloud. So that the, the music of the poem is coming off the page somehow. Yeah. Lauren, Lauren, you had a question I want you to. Uh, I think you sort of touched on this a little bit, but after hearing your poems read a few times, this time what really stuck out to me was your repetition, which is something that in my own writing I've tried to almost avoid because it's really, really hard <laughs> <laughs> to not make it very obvious uh -huh. and irritating. And I was wondering how, how you do it. Like whether it's a nafra or internal, like how do you? I knew you were gonna laugh at me. I'm I'm sorry. I'm giving you a hard time. Okay. Um, how do I do it? I don't know. Um, I think uh, what I usually do is I try to. I think what happens, in all honesty, is I try to milk a line or a set of lines for all that I can, right? I try to say everything I can possibly say. But then after you say everything you can possibly say, that doesn't mean that you feel done. And if you don't feel done, then you're not. I mean, you have to sort of trust your instincts, right? Um, I, I probably have said this to one of you before, but it's sort of like, um, LeBron James doesn't think, hmm, this will be a good time to make a jump shot. You, you know, like he's practiced at making a jump shot so he knows when it's time to do it and he just does it. There's no like, I wonder if maybe there's a jump shot. There's, I mean, it, that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen that way. He's in the heat of the game. He's a basketball player, so he makes the jump shot. He knows that it's time to make the jump shot because he knows. And if you're in the heat of writing the poem, if you make a practice of writing poetry, then you'll know, OK, I've milked this idea, but I need some opportunity to return. I need some sort of a hinge that allows me. And often what allows me to do that is to go back to some sort of a phrase that I've already used. And so repeating some phrase will send me into another direction other than where I've already gone. Does that answer your question? I'm glad. Brad, is that you? I can hardly see. Hey, Brad, your hair is so long. You have an afro. I like afros. Yes, ma'am. 
I have been to Best Buy, as a matter of fact. I used to stay there whenever I would go to New York because my best friend lived there. Actually, when my book first came out, I was fortunate enough to um, give, give a lot of readings all along the East Coast, and particularly in New York City. And what's, what, what's, the, what's the, the interesting thing about New York is, um, because it's New York, when they fly you out, they don't give you a place to stay. So, or they don't even fly you out. They, they're just like, we command your presence, you know. Uh, <laughs> and you can't say no, right? So, so whenever I would go there, I would stay with my friend who lived in, um, in, Bed-Stuy, in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. And so um, it's really interesting being in, in, to be in that neighborhood and to see, to see this film. What's interesting to me, though, about this film that's different from being in bed is that somehow or another, and I think it has to do with color, right? Uh, and you're going to notice this tonight. Everything in here is just so red and orange and yellow. Like it's something going on that somebody, I don't know who is what in the, in the crew, but they know how to make the heat. You know, so much of the film is about the heat of the day. And so part of what the backdrop is are those colors, right? And so, um, but because of that, you always feel like that neighborhood is a lot more full than what I felt like it was when I was there. It's, when I, whenever I've been to Bed-Stuy, I feel like it's a lot more peaceful and, and there's something about it, I mean, it's, it's Brooklyn, it's Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, but there's something about it that's like space. I don't know how to explain this other than there's some, there's some sort of a quiet about the people there that is very different from what I experienced when I watched the film actually. It's almost as if, I think it has to do with everybody sort of knowing one another. And then in the film, we have to be introduced to people. And so in spite of the fact that everybody in the film knows each other, we're constantly being introduced to very, I mean, this film has a lot of characters, you know, a lot of characters. So, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Audience, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, it's, it, I, I, thank you for asking. Uh, <laughs> it is, it's weird, you know, because there are certain things like, you know, like there are lines that are funny, but then when you read to certain kinds of audiences, they don't feel like they're supposed to laugh. Um, it's like, oh, that sounded funny, but if I laugh, couldn't, yeah, it couldn't have been funny. That couldn't have happened. Um, there, I mean, so there, there are lines like that in the poems. There are little moments in the poems where, for other audiences, there will be sort of vocal, like I can hear that I'm doing okay up here. And then sometimes, but sometimes I get an audience where things are really, really quiet, and that doesn't necessarily mean I'm doing a bad job. But that's why, either way, I really do have to sort of, like, act like y'all aren't there. <laughs> Because if I if I think about you being there, then I'll 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 think I'm failing either way. It's like oh they're shouting, maybe I'm doing something wrong, <laughs> like yelling at me, you know. So yeah, it is it is different. You know. Yes. Well, I'm curious as to um, where you were in your where you were in your development as when you first started receiving positive feedback for finding your voice and whether you have any thoughts for those of us who are trying to nurture young people as they are growing so that they too find a voice. Yeah, um, that second question is gonna take some time. I'm glad you asked the first one because it'll give me a second to stall. stall. So the, 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 the first question has to do with the fact that we're always changing and growing and getting better if we're really trying to get better, right? Um, and so I think there was a point when I was in New Orleans, I remember I, I applied for this workshop. Well, actually what I remember is I read a poem once, and there's a poet that I love. I mentioned him earlier, his name's Terrence Hayes. I read this poem, and Terrence Hayes happened to be in New Orleans that day, and I just read this one poem at like an open mic. And he like walks up to me, and he's like, oh, so where are the poets in New Orleans? And I'm like, why do you think I know? You know, and it was, and I was like, who are you? Like, is, 
But that moment, like after I figured out who he was, that moment has always been important to me because I felt like, oh, this poem I read must be really good. He walked up to me and thought I was a poet, you know, and I had that reaction. But then there's also the moment when I, you know, I applied to a PhD program in, in creative writing, and I remember getting the call that I had gotten into the program, you know, which is a very different kind of a moment. And um, this, the poet Ed Hirsch calls me on the phone. And he says, we really loved your poems. We think you should come out. Just let us know. Ciao. And I'd never really heard a person, I'd never really heard a person say ciao. Like I was like, are you serious? Ciao. So like, and, but I think for me that was like, oh, that's my first ciao. <laughs> wow, I'm doing it. I'm, so I think, I think that first question, things are really different. Um, the second question, though, is it's just really hard because you have to know where to, um, you know, you're always like, when, when you're working with young people, which is something I do love, I do, I love it. I love teaching. Uh, and I hope that's, I hope that's clear to my students that I love teaching. But it becomes really hard because you, you're always, and you're always somewhere in the back of your mind thinking about where the line, it's such a fine line between nurturing them and encouraging them and sort of like just being absolutely evil to them and like treating them badly. Um, so that, because different students need different things at different times, right? There's a different kind of encouragement that, that our president calls tough love or something like that, I guess, right? There's a different kind of encouragement that is, I think, necessary often in the classroom for students, you know, students have to push and be pushed in order to, to reach new levels of their talent. Um, but they also have to be encouraged and told, you know, you have to be able to look at what they're doing and see just how unique it is and let them know, hey, this thing you did right here is really original and unique. Do more of that. You know, so that's what I try to do. Worst part of my job, I know. Sorry. <laughs> Thank y'all so much. <laughs>